Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to the Velikovskian, where we examine ancient history and its mysteries from the perspective of the theories of Emmanuel Velikovsky. Today I want to look at one of the most fascinating and puzzling of all the mysteries connected with ancient Egypt, that of the cocaine and tobacco mummies. In 1992, the Forensic Science Laboratory at Ulm University in Germany was asked to examine an Egyptian mummy, that of a priestess named Henotawi, for the presence of narcotic drugs. This was part of a wide range in study into the use of mind-altering drugs in ancient societies. Now, to the great surprise of Professor Svetla Balabanova, who led the investigation, the team found clear evidence of tobacco and cocaine in the hair, soft tissue and bone of the mummy. Tobacco and cocaine, of course, are derivatives of, Mer of American plants and were supposedly unknown in Europe prior to the time of Christopher Columbus. So shocked were the scientists at Ulm that they repeated the experiment under more stringent conditions and sent samples of the mummy's tissue to other universities to have them investigate. All of them found the same thing, substantial quantities of tobacco and cocaine. It was only after all possibility of contamination or other errors had been ruled out that Balabanova and her team published their findings in the science journal Naturwissenschaften. They were met with a barrage of ridicule and criticism, which at times bordered on straightforward abuse. Balabanova herself was surprised at the reaction, though perhaps she should not have been, human nature being what it is. In fact, what the Ulm team found merely confirmed what had actually been first noted in 1976, when a French forensic team discovered tobacco in the abdomen of the great pharaoh Ramses II. That finding too, of course, was dismissed. The idea that transatlantic contact and even trade occurred in the time of ancient Egypt was just too much outside the ken of accepted thought for it to be accepted or even considered. And the more recent discoveries of Balabanova have suffered the same fate. There's now a page on the cocaine mummies in Wikipedia, and here, as we might expect, we find what can only be described as a somewhat oily and disingenuous, not to say weasel-worded attempt, to downplay the significance of the findings. For once we accept contact across the Atlantic in the time of the pharaohs, we need to begin the process of rewriting the history books in a most fundamental way. So the Egyptians probably did have access to cocaine and tobacco. But this then begs the question, how did they get their hands on it? Did they sail across the Atlantic themselves to procure it? Highly unlikely. Most probably the narcotic plants were traded to Egypt by the Phoenicians. Now, the Phoenicians, whose home was in modern Lebanon, were the great seamen of the ancient world. They set up colonies throughout the western Mediterranean as early as the 8th century BC, and there's no question that they voyaged into the Atlantic. They most certainly reached Britain, where most of the tin used for making bronze in the ancient world was to be found. And the famous account of Hamilco of Carthage from the 6th century BC records such a voyage. But it may not have been the Phoenicians who journeyed across the Atlantic. In Spain, the Phoenicians came into contact with another great seafaring people, the Tartessians. The Tartessian homeland was southern Spain, roughly modern Andalusia. And they, by Hamilco's own account, were daring seafarers who had journeyed throughout the North Atlantic long before the Phoenicians. But could they have reached America? Well, yes, they could have, and the evidence suggests very strongly that they did. Due west of southern Spain, just over a thousand miles into the Atlantic, lies the volcanic archipelago of the Azores. Any voyagers from Spain would almost certainly have used the Azores as a supply depot on the way to and from America. Now, when the first Portuguese explorers reached the Azores in the 15th century, the islands were uninhabited. However, it is alleged that the Portuguese found clear signs that people had been there before, 
Various artifacts of Greek or Roman appearance were found. Among these, several allegedly Carthaginian coins and an equestrian statue on a prominent hill with the rider pointing to the west. This was said to have been taken back to Portugal and presented to the king. So it's not doubted that in ancient times the existence of the Azores was almost certainly known. But it would appear that people had been there long before the Greeks, Romans or Phoenicians. A series of stone pyramids similar to the ones found in the Canary Islands stand on the Azorean island of Pico. These have recently been investigated by Portuguese archaeologists and it would appear that the structures are very old. In addition, rock-cut chambers, or hypogea, anciently used as tombs, or apparently used as tombs, occur in several of the islands. I would suggest that all of these features were fashioned by early Tartessian sailors who used the Azores as a supply depot on the way to and from America. It would have been from the Tartessians that the Phoenicians and then the Greeks and Romans learned of the existence of the archipelago. But why would ancient sailors have made the exhausting and perilous journey across the Atlantic just to access some narcotic plants? In order to investigate that question, we need to look at Egyptian religious beliefs. According to Egyptian tradition, the kingdom of Osiris, Lord of the Dead, lay just beyond the western horizon. It was believed that the sun god entered the land of Osiris every night and that he sailed across the river of the dead at night before resurrecting in the morning. For the Egyptians, narcotic drugs coming from the far west in a mythical land beyond the western ocean would have been almost priceless. This was all the more true since mind-altering drugs were used by many ancient religions, including those of the Americas, to gain access to or a vision of the spirit world. The Egyptians, too, almost certainly used drugs in this way. And drugs originating in the far west would have been especially sacred. We cannot doubt, therefore, that the Egyptians would have paid the Tartessians and Phoenician traders large amounts of gold and silver for such precious products, and thereby make it worth their while to risk such a perilous journey. With the Christianization of Egypt and the Roman Empire, the use of mind-altering drugs in religious ritual was discontinued, hence the abandonment of the Atlantic trade route and the Azorean colony. The Tartessians are in many regards a fascinating culture. They rose to prominence, so far as we can tell, around the 9th century BC. Many writers, both ancient and modern, have claimed them to be descended from the Atlanteans, and it is highly likely that the Tartessians themselves had such a tradition. The idea or myth of a lost island in the ocean is still current in Spain, as well as in virtually every country on the western seaboards of Europe and Africa. The traditional Spanish name for the lost land was Ilha Verde, the Green Isle. In the story of Atlantis, which according to Plato, the Egyptian priests of Sais recounted to Solon of Athens, the lost island is described as volcanic and just a little bigger than Ireland. It is located opposite or in front of the Pillars of Hercules, i.e. the Straits of Gibraltar. That would place it precisely at the Azores. In Plato's account, the Atlanteans were great seafarers who traded with the peoples of the Mediterranean, but also with the nations of a great continent which lay to the west of Atlantis. This continent was reached via a series of islands which acted as stepping stones. Clearly, the people who told the Egyptians the story of Atlantis were aware of America's existence. This then would seem to suggest that it was the Tartessians who were the ultimate source of the Atlantis legend. From them, the Phoenicians would have carried the story to Egypt and the Egyptians recorded it in their sacred literature. All of this then begs another question. Did Atlantis really exist? This is a huge topic, one I intend to examine in a future video. For the moment, all I want to say is that cosmic catastrophes involving massive disruption of the Earth's tectonic plates 
did actually occur. So that the catastrophic sinking of a large island, as recounted in the Atlantis story, is not impossible. Furthermore, geology has now revealed a mini continental plate comprised of granite and sedimentary rocks and about the size of Iceland, just underneath the Azores archipelago. Evidence suggests that this mass of continental material sank into the ocean in a comparatively recent time. One final point. The priestess Henatowi, as well as Ramses II, in whose bodies were found tobacco and cocaine, are currently supposed to have lived long before the Tartessians or Phoenicians opened up the sea routes of the Atlantic. However, as Emmanuel Velikovsky demonstrated repeatedly, the chronology of Egypt is completely wrong. Kings and dynasties need to be moved much closer to our time. And so Ramses II, for example, actually reigned in the 6th century BC, just before the Persian invasion of Egypt, a point I have demonstrated in great detail in my recently published book, Egypt's Ramesside Pharaohs and the Persians. In the 6th century BC, the Tartessians and Phoenicians would have already been thoroughly acquainted with the trading routes of the North Atlantic. If you like this video, please share it with others, as well as pressing the like button and subscribing to my channel. Many thanks.